limits and continuity. So we're going to take concepts from calc one and apply them to calc three. So concepts from two dimensional calc into three dimensional calc. I normally don't go through all the pictures in the PowerPoint, but I thought I should because this is the delta epsilon definition of limits. It's always a scary looking stuff in calc one. Remember this from calc one. If you want to find the limit of a function, then you're going to be given a certain epsilon. The epsilon is the yellow shaded part here that's to the top and bottom of the value that we're looking for. That's your epsilon. If you make that epsilon smaller, then that will make your delta smaller also. Delta is the difference here between the place where you're taking the limit and the boundary. So this one looks like a limit as x approaches 3. I want an epsilon value of 1. So I'm willing to go a unit above and a unit below, which will allow me to put in x values that are between 1 and 5 in order to get a limit that's within that given epsilon. So in two dimensions, that's what it looks like. Your epsilons in this case are blue. Your deltas are yellow. Yellow and blue make green. So anything in here is within that acceptable value. Now, normally we don't use epsilon values of one. We use much smaller values of epsilon, but that's what it looks like in two dimensions. So what do you think it looks like in three dimensions? Huh, it looks like this. Now you're looking for the distance between P and P sub zero on the XY plane over here. So look at that circle that's around the XY plane. How small does that delta need to be in order to produce an acceptable epsilon? Now epsilon here is on the Z axis. Is this distance here. It's from the limit above and from the limit below. So I just thought it might be interesting to see where my delta and where my epsilon land in three dimensions rather than two dimensions. And you can see I gave you the whole formula for delta epsilon. No, we're not going to do any delta epsilon proofs in this course. I know it's disappointing, but at some point you will take an analysis course and you will get to do all those delta epsilon proofs in two dimensions and maybe if you're lucky in three dimensions also. All right, limits and limit techniques. How do we find limits? Well, if we know how to find limits in two dimensions, we know how to find limits in three dimensions, except that now the limits are going to involve both an X and a Y to be substituted. What do we do when we take a limit? The first thing we always do is we try direct substitution. So in this case, we put a negative two in for Y. We put a one in for X. And so on the bottom, we've got a negative two plus two times one. So that gives us a negative two. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. On the bottom, though, we end up with a 0. Uh-oh. Well, that's not good. So what can we do to help us out here? One thing we can do is we notice that on the top, both terms have a y. So let's factor out a y. Let's take a y out of both terms in the numerator, and we end up with y times y plus 2x on the top and a y plus 2x on the bottom. Ah, oh, look at that. Top and bottom, they go away, and that gives us y. Now take the limit again. Take the limit as y approaches negative 2, and we just get negative 2. All right, not bad. The next one down here, what do we do with the square root of x plus y minus 3? Well, first thing is you put in the 4 and the 5. You can see right away when you put in a 4 for x and a 5 for y in the bottom, you're going to get something that's undefined. So what about either factoring or multiplying by a conjugate? You could actually go both ways on this one. Maybe it's easier for you to see multiplying by a conjugate, so we'll stick with that. If I multiply top and bottom by the square root of x, minus, uh, square root of x plus y plus 3 on the top, square root of x plus y plus three on the bottom is going to look like an enormous mess for just a second because the top will actually turn out nice, right? I'll get the square root of X plus Y when I foil this, remember foiling, square root of X plus Y times square root of X plus Y will just give me an X plus Y. The outside terms and the inside terms will go away, right? You'll get three times the radical minus three times the radical that goes away. And then the last term will just be negative three times positive three, which is negative nine on the bottom you're going to get x plus y minus 9 times that square root of x plus y plus 3. But you notice what happens? This whole thing in the numerator is one chunk, and it cancels that entire chunk in the denominator. If I slide over, that gives me a 1 over square root of x plus y plus 3. Now I can put the values in. 
The values were 4 and 5, so that gives me a square root of 9, which is 3. So 1 over 3 plus 3, that limit is 1 6. So some of those techniques that you learned in Calc 1, multiplying by a conjugate, this one, if you happen to see that you could factor that bottom as radical x plus y minus 3, radical x plus y plus 3, you could have looked at it that way too and just canceled top and bottom. So that is one way to do it. Factoring is another way to do it. Simplifying, et cetera, where you can will help you with that. What about a case like this? I got a 4xy over 3x squared plus y. If I tried direct substitution, then clearly I'm going to get a 0 on the top and a 0 on the bottom. But what does that mean? Remember in Calc 1, we were able to L'Hopital it come up with a limit that way, but will that work here? What we're going to do is we're going to try approaching on different values. So let's take a look at approaching this point zero, 0, which is right in the middle there for x and y, to see what happens with the z's along the line y equals mx. In other words, what if I took lines and drew them in at 0, 0 with all different slopes? What difference would that make? So let's come over here and replace those y's with mx's. So I got 4x times mx over 3x squared plus mx squared. What does that do for me? Well, on the top, it gives me a 4m times x squared. On the bottom, it gives me a 3x squared plus m squared, x squared. Factor out an x squared in the bottom, and I'm left with a 4mx squared over x squared times, and then what's left, a 3 and an m squared. Well, those x squares cancel top and bottom, and I'm left with a 4m over 3 plus m squared. Well, now try different values of m. So try m equals 1. If m equals 1, I get 4 over 4, which is 1. So that limit is 1 if the slope of the line is 1. What if the slope of the line is negative 1? Then I get a negative 4 on the top, and 3 plus a negative 1 squared is 4. That gives me negative 1. Two of them are not equal. Limit doesn't exist. So when you go back to the picture, right, come back to this picture here, notice at 0, 0, you get different values. If x is equal to y, then you end up with z equals negative 1. Otherwise, you end up with z equals positive 1. Both those are at the same point. So you can't have two different z values at the same point. In that case, then, the limit doesn't exist. All right, let's talk a little bit about continuity. You know that in calc one terms, the left-hand limit has to equal the right-hand limit has to equal the value of the function. In three dimensions, it's basically the same thing. First of all, for a limit to, the limit has to exist, and the function has to be defined at that point, and the two values need to be the same. It can't be one of these, like remember in two dimensions, sometimes you would draw a graph like this, and you'd have a point up here, and sure enough, the limit would exist because the left and the right values are the same, but it's not the same as the value of the function. Well, basically, the same thing happens in three dimensions. The left and right limits have to be the same. The function has to be defined at that point, and the value that you got from the limit has to equal the value that you got from the function. All right, how does this work? Let's take a look. Where in R2 are these functions continuous? Well, the first one doesn't seem to have any problem. That denominator is never going to be zero. There's nothing crazy like logs. We were trying to take logs of negative numbers or radicals. We we're going to end up with negatives under the radical. So this first one here is continuous everywhere. So it's continuous on all of R2, right? We wouldn't necessarily say the set of all real numbers. That sounds like a one-dimensional thing. We're putting two dimensions in there. All right, this one on the bottom the second one actually comes up with an issue where x squared and y squared are equal. So as long as x squared is not equal to y squared, then we're okay. Anytime x squared is equal to y squared, we're dividing by zero. What does that look like? Well, if x squared equals y squared, then the problem happens on the line y equals x and y equals negative x. 
So is continuous at all points except along y equals x and y equals negative x. So you're going to end up with sort of craters in the middle of this function because anytime you're along that line y equals x and y equals negative x on the base of the figure, then that figure simply will not exist because you're dividing by zero. All right, how about the third one? The third one says f of x, y equals the natural log of x minus y. Well, this is a composition of functions, right? It's an x minus y, that's one function, and the outside function is a natural log of that. What do you know about natural logs? Natural log graph looks like this. So the natural log function can't be zero, it can't be negatives. So what's inside here has to be strictly greater than zero. So I need x minus y to be greater than zero. Another way of saying that is I need all x, y's such that x is greater than y. And in that case, I can't have anything that's less than y. I have to have, or equal to, I should say, I have to have x's that are strictly greater than y. All right, so here's a piecewise function. Is this function continuous at x, y equals zero, zero? So here's my question. First of all, I realize that if I had not made this a piecewise function, then the answer would be immediately no, because I can put a zero in for x and a zero in for y in this original function up here, and I'll end up with a zero over zero. It's not defined. But is it possible that I can fill in the hole by taking the origin, filling it in with a z value of zero, and seeing if it works? Well, in this case, I'd like to try to find the limit. What is the limit as x, y approaches zero, zero? If the answer is zero, then I'm good. If the answer is not zero, then I'm not good. What do we do? Well, last time we approached both sides on a line. And this time it seems more convenient to approach it on a parabola. So let's look at this along the parabola y equals mx squared. Um, actually, it'd be easier if we did it with the, in the reverse. Let's do x equals my squared. Because if I can get these powers on the top to be the same, then I can combine the like terms right away. So let's replace that x with an my. So I'm going to get y to the fourth minus 2my squared squared. And on the bottom, I'll get a y to the fourth plus my squared, right? Because that's only one. So I got an my squared squared. All right. So now I got a y to the fourth minus 2m squared y to the fourth. And on the bottom, I've got a y to the fourth plus m squared y to the fourth. So now I can factor a y to the fourth out of the top and I'll get a 1 minus 2m squared. On the bottom, if I factor out a y to the fourth, I get 1 plus m squared. All right, if these things really do approach the same limit, then it shouldn't matter what values of m I put in. I should get the same thing every time. So what if I put in an m equals 1? If I put in an m equals 1, I'll get 1 minus 2 on the top. I'll get 1 plus 1 on the bottom. That'll give me negative a half. Let's try a parabola with a slightly different bend. Let's do m equals negative 1. So now I'll get 1 minus 2 still on the top. On the bottom, I'll get 1 plus 1. That looks OK, right? I still get a negative 1 on the top and a 2 on the bottom. What if I choose m equals 2? I'm squeezing it in the corner here. I get 1 minus, well, 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. On the bottom, 2 squared is 4 plus 1 is 5. Ooh, negative 7 fifths? No. Because I keep getting different answers, right? I'm approaching on different paths, and I'm getting different values. So if that's the case, then my answer is no. That 0, 0 does not fill in the gap, and therefore that function is not continuous at 0, 0. I've assigned it a 0 to fill in the hole, and essentially what happens is I'm not actually filling in the hole. I'm just assigning it a value of zero, hoping that something works right. All right, this will be a real quick example. Rules for three variables, the same as the rules for two variables. What if I put in a 1, negative 1, 1 here? So I've got an x, y, z, 
1, negative 1, 1. I can see that if I put a 1 in here and a negative 1 in there, I'm going to end up with something divided by 0. So what do I do? Well, it would be helpful if I could factor this somehow. A little factor by grouping. You notice that both terms on the top have an x, so maybe this is heading somewhere. Pull out an x. I'm left with a z plus 5. Both of the second terms have y's, so let's pull out a y. And I'm left with, ah, a z plus 5. Right? That means the numerator factors as z plus 5 times x plus y. The bottom is x plus y. I've gotten rid of the problem, I hope. All right, so now I come over here. x is 1, y is negative 1, z is 1, so I replace a z with a 1. 1 plus 5 is 6, and that's my limit. So if I want to find the limit as x, y, z approaches a ordered triple, first thing is try direct substitution. After that, try factoring. This one had four terms, so I try to factor by grouping, and it worked, and there's my limit. And that's the end of this.